1830, Edwin, Beard Budding, from Stroud, invented the world's first lawnmower. The mower itself made him a fortune, but that would not have been the case without something that is still stashed away. This is actually the patent document for the world's first lawnmower. original document. So why was this necessary? Well, basically, so other people wouldn't steal his idea. I mean, it was an economic reality of the situation. And it would have cost quite a lot of money to actually take out a patent. So what's the date? It's 1830. So before lawnmowers, how did you cut the grass? Using a scythe, basically. Or sometimes you'd use sheep or goats to actually graze right. in areas. Did he make a lot of money out of this? No, sadly, he didn't. Um, like a lot of these inventors, it was the other people around them, the, um, the entrepreneurs with the money that made the money. Yes, because he wouldn't have had a factory, would he? No, that's right. He no. was a poor engineer, basically. Oh, right. Underneath, there's actually the drawing for the patent documents. Okay, so we'll so carefully then. Carefully. Put it away. Fill this up here. So along with the description of the technology, you'd have a diagram. Oh, look at that. Oh, isn't oh, that? Isn't it? Oh, that's wonderful. Amazing. It's a work of art in its own right, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So it says, budding machine for cropping or shearing grass plats, etc. So it's um, an early word for a lawn. And so from this, these basic ideas, the engineers would have worked out how to, to actually make it. That's right, they'd make mm. a prototype. I think um, Budding, Budding himself actually made the prototype, given that he was an engineer working at an iron foundry. Right. The blade here is not that different to how they are today. No, it's exactly the same t um, technology, actually, mm. the helical blade. Mm. He actually got the idea for it um, from a textile machine that was used to crop the nap from, from cloth to, to produce the very fine uh, baize cloth that um, Red Rare is famous right. for. Great time saver. Yes, but actually it did do people out of jobs, ultimately. Uh, we've got records of one of the first lawnmowers in 1831 sold to Regent Park Zoo in London, and um, the story goes that it did the work of six to eight men uh, using a scythe, so there's probably quite a sad story that goes alongside this as well. In 1590, Huguenots sought refuge in Britain. A small contingent settled in Stroud. In here, David, is glass, the Huguenot glass, and it's, it's my absolute favourite. So who were these Huguenots? Huguenots. They were actually religious uh, refugees that came over from northern France, and they were persecuted uh, by the Catholics. Some of them were burnt at the stake, and um, life was, was intolerable for them. So um, up to about 50,000 of them came to this country in the late 16th, early 17th century. So they were asylum seekers? They were. They were early asylum seekers. That looks like the bottom of the glass. I That's think. right. Mm -hmm. it's, it's tinged with green because um, there was um, iron, iron oxide right. actually in the, in the mix. And most of the Huguenot glass is actually green. Oh, wow. oh it's so light. It is, isn't it? It's, oh, it's very so delicate. fine. Were they particularly good at making glass? Yes, they were very skilled indeed. In fact, the reason why Elizabeth I gave them licence to come over to this country is because they had skills that the English didn't have in, in glass making. And in here, these um, little pieces, they're like um, sort of badges. They were called prunts, little decorative pieces that were actually stuck onto vessels. Some brilliant replicas of Huguenot glassware were made in 1918. Top manufacturers, Powell's of Whitefriars, toured Europe sketching examples. They came to Stroud and subsequently produced the Winchester series. Oh, look at that. Oh, isn't that fantastic? It's beautiful, isn't oh. it? It's very fine indeed. They use such high quality craftsmanship that these vessels have now become museum pieces in their own right. On, I showed you some prints mm -hmm. you know, that were mm -hmm. applied afterwards while the, um, oh, the I vessel see was they've made. Uh, and here we are, there's some um, yes. small prints on, on this vessel here. It's decoration. Gorgeous, aren't they? So oh, how 
how do they actually make the original glass? Well, we, it was it was a trade secret actually. They kept <laughs> it within the family, so there are no published accounts, but certainly I'm aware of of how they made it. So it died with them, sadly. We know that they arrived in um, 1588 from the parish records, and they were gone um, in the early 1600s. Not long. Not very long at all. So whether life was very pleasant for them, we don't know. You do wonder how they were treated by locals who maybe resented them because they would have been very wealthy. Mm. So they might have earned, say, 18 shillings a week, but whereas a normal a sort of crass person would be earning far less yes. than that. It wasn't just the French who brought something special to Stroud. Danish engineer Mikael Pedersen was a brilliant inventor, but no businessman. He was exploited by others and never made a fortune. Okay. I understand you invented this. I did indeed, sir. This is the Dursley Peterson bicycle. No doubt you own a bicycle yourself. I do indeed. Riding on the penny farthing with the big wheel at oh. the front. And yes, most difficult to ride, I'm sure you will agree. And most uncomfortable, sir. This is the big difference with my bicycle here. Notice the saddle. It is not an ordinary saddle, no, no. It is as similar to a hammock. It is woven so that it will stretch and accommodate you. I unveiled my bicycle to the world on October the 21st, 1893, by going uphill. I rode up the White Way in Dursley. Have you heard of it? I have. It is mm. a very steep hill, one in seven. Mm. All of that on a bicycle at that point made from wood, because I had not yet discovered the way of joining the frame together. Now, you will notice the... Mm. Uh, special frame. Yes. It is very strong, but it is also very light. And the secret of the strength lies in the shape that you see here, the triangle, sir. Mm -hmm. And of course, ladies can ride on this bicycle as well. But, but what about... Well, yeah. I, this is why I have to sign the special clothing, sir. Oh. Special clothing. Now, no doubt you have heard of a lady from America by the name of Emilia Bloomer. Bloomers? Yes, indeed. She invented the bloomers. Oh. They were known as the radical dress. And the ladies there were able to ride bicycles wearing the bloomers, uh, but they were banned from a number of hostelries and other places for indecent wear. But I have invented a skirt which is split down the middle with, if you want, the bloomers underneath, so the lady looks as if she is perfectly ordinary dressed and can ride one of my bicycles with the greatest of ease. And what's this lever here? This lever here, here is for changing the gears to make it easier for you to go up and down the hills. He might get a shock if he could see the number of gears we have on our bikes these days. We've come a long way since his three-speed hub gear was patented in 1902. Now my aim is to develop a gear which is almost frictionless. And sadly I fear this may be my downfall. For we have not yet managed to create one where it is not slipping. And unfortunately, um, the company is losing money. My engineer, Anatold Mellerup, who came with me from Denmark, he actually said to me that uh, we should give it up forever and go to an ordinary gear, but I am determined to make this work as I am determined to make all of my inventions work. No company in Denmark would accept Pedersen's design, but Listers in Dursley gave him a workshop where he produced 30,000 machines between 1894 and 1914. Who buys your bike? A number of racing cyclists, but also one of the important people who has bought one is the Sultan of Morocco, who has bought a number, actually, for, uh, some say, for his harem of wives. So, sir, you must be a very rich man. Oh, I am. I am reasonably rich, but I fear the gears may be my undoing, you see, oh, sir. Right. I fear that I may lose a lot of money there and may have to uh, sell the bicycle off. That's very sad, but it's a wonderful invention. Well, I thank you, sir. Thank you very much. We owe the man more than most of us realise.